Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Ask Katie Anything. I'm your host, licensed marriage and family therapist, Katie Morton. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, I'm going to answer, let me see, I think it's eight questions today. But if you have a question that you keep asking and doesn't get answered, you can hop over to my Patreon page. That's patreon.com forward slash Katie Morton. Every month I answer questions on a live stream. If you're at the $20 tier and above, there are also all sorts of different tiers to meet any kind of budget. So that's just another way to engage with the community and to get some more helpful resources. So you can hop over there and check it out. But without further ado, let's jump into today's questions. And the first one says, hello, hello. I love the pod and all that you do. Oh, thanks. Due to childhood trauma, I've known that I dissociate from my problems. What I don't know is apparently when I'm triggered. For example, with this podcast on occasion, a tough topic will come up. And I'll realize that I've been floating along in my thoughts and I missed the entire answer to a question. And when you say, does that make sense? And the only answer I have is, did what make sense? Only to rewind and dissociate a little less this time. I'll check in with myself and I don't feel overwhelmed or afraid. I don't feel much of anything about the topic. Red flag, I know. My question is, where do I start when I don't even know I'm being triggered? And it says, edit for clarity. The video reference is a minor example. I usually lose 50, 45 minutes to an hour and a half. Okay, <clears throat> this is a great question. And I think this is really common and unfortunately isn't something that I've talked about recently. And sorry if you're watching, I have an itch and I want to get it, my eyes itching. Okay, um, but I have makeup on so I can't just go in with a fist. Okay, so when, when we dissociate, I, and I know that I've talked a lot about like understanding the triggers and being like, oh, I'm feeling myself get overwhelmed. And we kind of feel the feel that buildup. Unfortunately, if we're completely disconnected, which for a lot of us is just the use, right? We don't, we don't get into our bodies. We aren't aware of what's happening. We aren't really aware of how we're feeling. We can sometimes just, you know, white knuckle through things and maybe even just feel kind of numbed out. So that therefore, because we're numbed out, we aren't able to even know what's causing a dissociation and sometimes even realize it's happening like this person is talking about. And so I just want you to know that that's incredibly common because of the disconnection and the, I would call it almost like knee jerk reaction to just numb out all the time. It's like more comfortable where we're used to it. It's something that we do all the time. And it's probably helped us get through, like you said, your childhood trauma. It's helped us get through some really tough times. And that's our body's way of coping. So I'm not surprised that it's still happening because I would assume, you know, we haven't gotten ourselves to a place where the trauma isn't still affecting us in our day-to-day life or we're not still having some physical or psychological symptoms of PTSD. Does that make sense? Okay. So incredibly common. Now, the question that you're asking is, um, where do I start when I don't even know I'm being triggered? The truth is we have to take these past examples. So it's actually great. I, I hate that it's happening on my podcast. And I'm so sorry, but I know some of the topics are just without, you know, they're going to be triggering for some people and there's nothing we can really do about it. But it's great that this is happening because you can go back to those episodes and re-listen like you said you're doing. But when we do what what I call detective work, right, we'll be curious, not judgmental. We're not going to jump to any conclusions. We're just going to learn about our process. We can actually re-listen to the quote-unquote triggering event otherwise known as my podcast and those questions right and we can dig into those what do we think about that was triggering I'd assume it's topic based but that's helpful to know okay topics around um, assault or sexual abuse or you know name your thing maybe food related stuff whatever it is, self-injury, something in there is triggering and that's helpful information. And it's great because we can look back at the last time we dissociated listening to the podcast. We can go back through it and we can notice it again. Oh, it happened here. And when I say, does that make sense? We're like, oh shit, I wasn't even listening. What question was that? And in the descriptions of all these, I always have the questions, at least part of them. So you can look in there and be like, oh, I think it might be this topic. That's helpful information. That's where we start. We start by taking the examples that we we realize after the fact we were dissociated, we're curious and we're a detective for information about what we think that trigger could have been. And then we look back at it and we figure out what it is because the, and the reason some of you might be thinking, well, why do we even need to know? 
Shouldn't we just build up resilience or build up our coping skills so that things don't bug us? Sure, but sometimes we don't even know when to implement them or what they're surrounding, what to work on in therapy. Because for those of you who don't know, also in trauma work, sometimes we don't have full memories of the trauma. We might not be at a place where we can even talk about what happened, but we can talk about how it's affecting us today. And that's a great place to start in our trauma work. And for many people, it's the most vital part, right? It allows us then to go out into our life and day and do what we need to do without feeling super reactive, hypervigilant or whatever. So long story short, that's where we start. Let's go back to the times we're triggered. Let's be curious, not judgmental about them and figure out what what those most triggering topics or uh, phrases or maybe even just words were. And then we bring that up in therapy and we work to better manage it. It could be through exposure, meaning we hear that over and over again. Maybe with my podcast, you listen to it over and over again, using your resources to kind of calm yourself to prevent yourself from dissociating. Maybe we do grounding techniques. We're going to have to strengthen that muscle, but we have to know what's triggering it first before we can even understand it or know what to process in therapy or what to work on. Does that make sense? I hope so. Now, and the person who said, that's a red flag, I know. Um, Yes, of course, we're getting overwhelmed. This is a symptom of, of PTSD. And you said you have childhood trauma. So we, it's no surprise there. And I just want you to know that Sure, it's a red flag that like, oh, we need to do something about this. Um, But nothing's wrong with you. It's very, very common. And I hope that my answer is helpful. Now, there were add-ons to this, okay? First one says, can dissociation become a coping mechanism when you're relatively older? I've been emotionally abused by my four-year older sister. And my dad has autism and has been through trauma himself because his father was an alcoholic. And my mom has told me that she thought about ending her life. Luckily, she didn't because she was severely depressed when my sister and I were young. I feel like I have to quote unquote use dissociation as a coping mechanism when I start talking about this in therapy. Oh, when I started talking about this in therapy 10 years ago, I was 12 at the time and have been dissociating ever since. Can dissociation due to build a, can dissociation occur due to a buildup of life events or is it caused by genetic predisposition or something else? I also nearly drowned as well when I was four years old and had two heart surgeries, one at eight weeks old and one open heart surgery at two and a half years old. Thanks for everything you do. I always look forward to the podcast. Oh, of course, of course. I'm glad it's helpful. Um, Dissociation is definitely a coping skill. The reason that it happens, whether we're consciously aware of it or not, is to remove us from ourselves or our environment because it's overwhelming to our system. And I really want you to hone in on the overwhelming to our system. We can try to place judgment all around dissociation. Like, well, nobody else seemed overwhelmed or why would that be so stressful? It's not that big of a deal. It is to your nervous system. It was to you psychologically, physically, whatever. It felt overwhelming. And your brain, in order to have you keep going and survive, it was like, well, let's just put a little distance between us and what's going on right now. Wow, it pulls the ripcord. We remove ourselves either from self or environment. And even though it in, in and of itself, dissociation can be uncomfortable because a lot of people will be like, I want to get back and I can't, or it just feels like spacey or you don't have any memory and people hate that. But it is helpful in your brain and nervous system think, oh, it saved me from that shitty, you know, replaying of that thing that was triggering, or I don't like being around crowds. So I like, didn't feel like I had to be. So it is a coping skill. Now, it doesn't matter what age we are. It happens when we're young, it happens when we're old. It all depends on us being able to manage without it because it's only there because we have no other way of coping. And like I said, I know it's uncomfortable. Most people don't want it to happen all the time. Even if it feels good, we can be like, I don't remember that conversation I had with my best friend or my boss or my spouse or whatever. And that can be distressing, right? Because we're like, well, shit, I don't know what I said. And so even my patients who find it more blissful or more enjoyable still don't like it happening because we don't have control over it usually it just comes about right so to the person who asked had this comment you've had a ton of trauma in your life medical familial you know all sorts of stuff even transgenerational trauma because both your parents had a tough time all this stuff and i think dissociation is your way to manage the ptsd symptoms right now and that's okay no need to judge however through therapy, you will find other ways to cope and ways to stay grounded. 
and we'll build up those like resources so that when we start to feel like, oh, I'm feeling overwhelmed, right? Like we're talking about earlier, the being triggered. If we don't even know it's happening, we need to figure out, you know, what be detective, figure out where it's coming from and then incorporate some of those coping skills. Could be full body shakes, could be calling a friend, could, um, could be distracting, could be journaling, could be whatever. We do the thing. We, it could be imagining we're in like uh, the best, happiest place or taking ourselves back to a happy memory from, you know, on a last year or maybe childhood if someone, if that happens to have some happy memories in there, either way. We take ourselves there. <sighs> it helps calm our system down, soothe us, remind us that we're okay and we're safe so that then we can stay present and push through. And that, like, like I said, a lot of that's going to be done in trauma work, in therapy. Um, so that's why it's happening. Yes, it is a coping mechanism. It's incredibly common and it's there to protect you. But now it sounds like it might be getting in the way. And so let your therapist know that this is happening with, you know, a, a lot, like really frequent. And so they can try to help you find ways to stay present. Now there's another add on. It says, how would I re Oh, how would I rediscover my emotions? 90% of the time I feel nothing where before I'd have laughed out loud. I now only have a half smile. There are brief sparks of frustration and anger, anxious discomfort in my body, but not much beyond that. Instead of crying at injustice, like I used to, I have moral reactions and I feel a knot in my chest. In childhood, when I had to lie and hide my emotions because of the abuse, I still knew what I was feeling and I would cry or a journal smash rocks in the forest. Nowadays, I have to watch for physical symptoms and analyze my thoughts to guess what I could have been feeling. I don't remember when this shift occurred. Do you have any suggestions? Um, usually we, this is numbing out. Essentially we've disconnected. We're like, I can't. So we aren't listening anymore. And instead our body is listening because as far as I can, all of my experience, all of my conversations with you online, we cannot shut our body off. Unfortunately, we can numb out, binge eat. We can self injure. We can do all this stuff, but those emotions, those experiences, those trauma responses, like, you know, unfortunately the book called the body keeps the score and people are like, I wish my body would stop keeping the score, but it's very true because it, it comes through though in those physical symptoms. And that's what you're experiencing. And so what I would guess is that either we've become overwhelmed, like we've had a new trauma or something else happened. We're feeling super maxed out in life. I don't know what else is going on, but I'd be very curious about that. Also, there's a part of me that wonders if because, you know, you you grew up with, you know, you had to lie and hide your emotions and there was abuse. So you grew up with a traumatic upbringing. I wonder if now you finally feel okay enough to start processing it. And so all of the essentially emotions that maybe we had to lie or stuff down, even though you're saying like, I still knew what they were. We never got to express them and they were never accepted. And all of the like, you know, PTSD symptoms, we just like, oh, stuff it and go forward. I'm wondering if now we feel okay enough. And so now it's, you know, it's coming up more and that's causing us to kind of disconnect. This could be kind of part of dissociation when we disconnect from our emotions. They're still there. We're just not experiencing them because we don't have the capacity. Do you know what I mean? Like when I don't know if anybody else has ever felt this way, but I'll give an example. Like, you know, when you're really busy work or school or even just home life stuff and you're in the middle of doing like three different things. Like, let's say um, I get home from work and I know that I have some follow up stuff I need to do. So I'm like walking to my office in the house to be like, I got to do I don't even know this. I got to send these emails. I need to reply to this person. I have like this list in my head. And as I walk, I also turn on the dryer because I'm like, oh, the clothes are in there. I need to fluff them. I need to fold them, blah, blah, blah. And then on my way to the office, when I'm sitting, finally sit down, I'm writing the email. Sean's like, hey, could you do? And I'm like, I don't have room in my brain right now for more, you know? And I mean, you could add in like, let's say I have kids or something like things just feel very overwhelming. I don't have capacity. That happens to all of us. We're just like, hey, that's a, I can't. Like, if you're going to put that other thing I got to do in, something else got to come out. You know, I felt that way. I'm sure many of you felt that way before. That could be what's going on here. You're like, you're barely surviving through things. And then they added another layer of stuff. And you're like, oh, I just don't have capacity. I legitimately don't know what to do with what's happening. And so we we numb out. We shut it down. Because the only way for us to keep going forward is to not experience it, right? Because we don't have any room for it. 
I hope that makes sense. It's almost like trying to shove something into an overly full closet where like you keep trying to close the door and it won't close. So finally, we're just like, leave it open and ignore it. Right. Yeah. So um, my suggestions for you. Okay. So we're not feeling emotions 90% of the time. I would keep doing what you're doing, watching for those physical symptoms and be curious about it. Try to figure out what you're feeling. And honestly, and this is kind of a shitty answer, but it's the truth, is I really think we're going to need some trauma therapy. I think that's where these things are hiding. I think that's where that connection can be rebuilt. Um, we could look for a trauma, trauma specialist or a somatic experiencing or somatic based therapist. That could be incredibly beneficial, especially since you are kind of in tune with how your body feels and you do recognize that it responds to emotions that you aren't allowing yourself to feel. I think that could be really, really key and really healing. But because you, you're able to identify them after the fact, or if you're really curious about what's going on in your body, you're like, I think, I think I might be feeling that, you know, you have that awareness. I don't think it's necessary for you to do like, you know, jotting down what it, what a feeling feels like to you. You could do that. We could use the feelings wheel and try to identify. Um, but I feel like we're going to, that blocker in there, that defense mechanism is that trauma response. And we're going to need to work on some ways to calm our system down. Now you could do that on your own. Also journaling is a great way to take the edge off. Um, you know, just do, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, like a page and don't care what it looks like. Just get it out. Um, you can do that. We could do some body shakes, stomp our feet, you know, shake that out, get some of the energy out. Um, we could, you know, go for walks to move our body. We could call a friend. We could, um, paint our nails, organize something, clean the house in some way. There's all sorts of distractions and coping skills we could put in there, but whatever we do, we need to make sure it like kind of takes the edge off, helps us feel even incrementally better. And that should allow for slowly, but surely a reconnection. Okay. I hope that makes sense. Now there was another comment on this and it says, Hey Katie, I was sexually abused as a child and I suffer from dissociation a lot, including when I think about anything that has to do with sex. Of course, that's super triggering for you. I have a long history of self-harm and I can only feel sexual arousal when I think about me getting hurt. And this feels extremely bad. What is wrong with me? Nothing's wrong with you. Also, I have BPD and an eating disorder. Okay. Nothing's wrong with you. Unfortunately, due to the sexual abuse, because it was a harmful, painful experience, we are only able, because that's what we associated as a kid, right? Which is, it's just very, the whole thing's very obviously inappropriate and bad, right? Like, I don't know what else, it's a shitty thing. And I'm sorry that you went through that. But sexual abuse does something interesting when we're growing up, because we don't really know what love looks like. Often we don't have any history of like any sexual uh, interest, experience, anything like that. No intimacy with other people, right? We're too young for that. It's not part of, we're, we might be in the curious phase where we're like, oh, what, you know, private parts, what are those? What do they look like? Well, you know, we have more of that natural curiosity, but no sex drive, right? The harm, but it's not happening yet. Therefore, when we're, uh, you know, rushed into or exposed to sexual things before that point, we make these early determinations without realizing it, that sex equals pain, right? That I get hurt. And that's where like sexual arousal comes from, because that's our only experience and the only connection we've made. So nothing's wrong with you. This is a response to the abuse you sustained as a child. I encourage you as much as possible to stop judging yourself around this and just be curious and find a therapist that you can slowly but surely open up to about what happened and process through how it's coming up for you. That could mean we do talk therapy and we talk through as much of the details as we can until it doesn't upset us anymore or it's not emotionally charged. Or that could mean that we, um, you know, do some EMDR or we worry about how it's showing up in our, our body today and what we can do to kind of expel that energy or process through that. Um, there's going to be a lot of different ways we can, you know, get at this. And of course, the eating disorder um, is a coping skill for what you're going through. And I, I would assume that as these symptoms come up, the eating disorder gets worse. And as they go down, it gets better. And also BPD, I'm not surprised either. It doesn't always come out of trauma, but it can. <clears throat> and that's incredibly common. And I think that that's why, you know, that's on board here as well. So nothing's wrong with you. That connection was made at a young age and we haven't had an opportunity to process through it. Okay. 
Okay, let's move on to question number two. And this question says, hi, Katie, I hope you're doing well. I am, I hope you're doing well. So my question is that I always hear people talk about the symptoms of depression. And one of them that they always talk about is a feeling of emptiness. They do. What I'm wondering is feeling nothing the same as feeling empty? This is a great question. There's a, a couple add-ons. I think there's just two add-ons on this, but let's get into this because they can sound very similar, but they're a little bit different, okay? So feeling nothing is legitimately a void, right? Like we look out and there's nothing there. Imagine nothingness means that there is, it's, it's empty. Nothing. And I know I'm using the term empty. I probably shouldn't have. I'm sorry. But just imagine you're looking out into a room and it's just, it's just a floor with nothing on it. It's just a dark room with nothing in it. That's when we feel nothing. That usually means, I mean, both of these feel are part of disconnection, but nothing, there's nothing there. Emptiness, I, I personally think is more of a void. It means that there was something that should be there. And when we feel empty, it's like something's missing. Nothing is just, oh, there's nothing in there. Does that make sense? I know that's so nuanced. And I don't really think in the grand scheme of things, I don't think we need to tease this out. I think it, it would be fine. I wouldn't have any problem if someone's like, well, I see them as the same. I'd be like, that's fine too. It's the, the void of feelings that is part of depression usually. But that emptiness... It, it really is like a lack of, and we feel that lack. And I think that kind of feeds into our fatigue and our lack of interest in things and our overall just low and down mood because we feel like something's missing. Like most of my depressed patients will, will notice that something's wrong if they don't know it's depression already. <clears throat> They'll say, I just, ugh, I just feel like something's missing. I feel like I should enjoy things. I feel like you know, I should feel happier. There, there, something's missing, right? Something's not quite right here versus the nothing where you're like, well, there's just nothing out there. Does that make sense? I hope so. So that's how I tease them out. And so I think in essence, that emptiness is a part of depression because it essentially is kind of part of that whole swirling uh, lack of that we can feel, lack of interest, lack of enjoyment, lack of sex drive, uh, could be lack of appetite or increased appetite, but lack of sleep at night, um, but being tired all day. So lack of rest, you know, I feel like it's just a lack of for most of the symptoms of depression and emptiness is one of those as well, where nothing can be like, well, there was nothing there. So there's nothing to miss. Does that make sense? Okay. Now there's a comment on this. It says, as an add-on, how is the emptiness showing when it comes to thoughts concerning our future? Does feeling empty mean that we feel no hope or no plans for the future? Or is it more that we're having wishes, but we feel so empty at the moment and cannot perceive them? Hmm. I guess this would depend on the person, but emptiness would show up in the, with thoughts concerning the future around feeling like it's just not going to be there. I think that's the thing about depression that is hard for people who haven't experienced it or haven't talked with enough people about it, I guess. And I might be off base too, right? I mean, I, there's definitely been times in my life when I've been depressed, but everyone's experience is different. So feel free to share yours in the comments or, you know, correct where you feel, you know, I was off base. But I think people forget or don't realize that depression removes any excitement, any, any forward thinking, any hope for tomorrow. It's, it's such a hopeless feeling that future would just not, mm -mm. we wouldn't, it would, it's not going to be there. It's lacking. It is an emptiness. It's, it's something's missing. The future is missing. We're having a tough time today. So to think about tomorrow or the future, or to think that that could even be something we would experience. It's really hard for us to hold on to, even if we don't have suicidal thoughts. Because de remember, depression and suicide don't always go together. They can, but they don't always. And so we can just have this like lack of future focused thoughts or lack of hope for the future or a vo like that emptiness, like it's missing. And I think that's kind of how it shows up. But again, everybody's going to be different. And so I don't think that my depressed patients have wishes for the future. They might still, you guys let me know. No one's ever told me they do because the hopelessness is just too intense. And so I guess it would just depend on maybe the the level of depression you're experiencing at the time or how it's showing up for you. But usually it, it takes away that kind of ability to see the future and have wishes for it or thoughts or hopes for it. Okay. 
Now, there was another add on. It says, I know a lot of skills for all different kinds of states or emotions, but I don't know what kind of skills could help with feeling empty. What are your thoughts on this? Should I look more into this like distraction or depression related skills? Is it more of a dissociation situation and therefore those skills would be better? I haven't found anything helpful yet. I truly think <clears throat> that the depression has robbed us of that. And so that emptiness, the feeling like something's missing, the real way, there's going to be a couple tools. It's going to take work and effort, which I know depression sometimes takes from us. So medication could really help with this, by the way. Um, an uh, SSRI, SNRI, otherwise known as an antidepressant, talk to your doctor, ask all your questions, make sure you're aware of side effects and pick something that works for you. And unfortunately, most of these take a few weeks to take effect, but I believe that that is probably our not easiest because it doesn't fix anything, you know, but it makes us feel better. It can take that edge off and allow the emptiness to hopefully subside. Okay. Now in the therapeutic component, if you came in to see me, I would refer you to psychiatrist, make sure, you know, whatever, if they want to put you on a medication, they would. And then what I would work on you with is actually more of the bridge statements and um, challenging some of those depressive thoughts. Because I find emptiness, I could be off base, but I find emptiness usually comes along with these thoughts or feelings of nothing's ever going to be better. I'm never good enough. It's this lack of right emptiness. Um, I look around, there's nothing to look forward to. There's nothing exciting happening. Um, my job is just a dead end job. You know, nothing, 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 blah, blah, blah. I don't enjoy yada, yada, yada. And that comes out in that way. And so my job as a therapist would be to help you identify some of those depressive thoughts, check your facts on them. And then use some bridge statements to make them less hopeless, less empty. And those would be phrases like, um, you know, I'm open to the idea that that maybe, maybe there is a future like Katie talks about. I don't know if I believe her, but it's possible, right? So we're just opening ourselves up to the possibility. And I feel like that shifts us out of that a little bit. Um, and checking the facts can help too. But when we're depressed, sometimes it's hard for us to come up with things to argue back fully or to completely, you know, look for other alternatives. Cause again, we just can't see it. It's like we have depressive blinders on. And that's why, again, the, I think medication as well as some of those bridge statements should help. Now, emptiness could come from dissociation. I find dissociation is more of like a numb out. So we might feel nothing. I don't know. You guys will have to let me know, but I've never had a patient with dis dissociation describe it as emptiness. They've more described it as like a distance or a fog or a space out or um, yeah, more of a numb out. So I don't think the grounding techniques would be helpful. And that's probably why you're like, nothing's been beneficial yet. So those are my thoughts. And I hope that that's helpful. Okay, let's move into question number three. And that question says, Katie, is it common for those of us who experienced trauma to get overwhelmed easily? Why does it happen and how can we deal with it? This is a great question. And the short answer is yes, it's very common. And the reason that those of us who are traumatized find ourselves getting overwhelmed so quickly or easily is because the trauma essentially wears at our resilience. And when I say resilience, I know people use that word a lot, but what I really mean is like, our ability to weather life's storms. So if I'm super resilient and I don't have a history of trauma, when someone is really rude to me, or if I'm running late and I didn't get to eat and like these things have happened in my day, I can dig into that kind of bank account of resilience and be like, oh, it's okay. I can use these tools to manage and I can kind of get through it. Is it perfect? No, but I don't become overwhelmed. I don't become dysregulated, meaning uh, cry uncontrollably, go it, fall into a pit of negative thoughts, uh, dissociate, have a panic attack. None of that happens because I'm able to utilize my other resources to get me through. Okay, I hope that makes sense. And so those of us who've experienced trauma, it kind of erodes some of that resilience. We can build it back. Don't worry, we can build it back. But the trauma makes us more hypervigilant. It can make us in like keep us in fight or flight for a really long time which can be exhausting make it hard for us to sleep you can see how it does these things that just pull at our ability to handle other things that happen <clears throat> it's almost like we're always one or two things away from being dysregulated and remember dysregulation can look like dissociation panic attacks 
uh, feeling emotionally volatile, either easily to easy to anger, easy to cry, all that stuff, right? So we're we're always just close to that because there's so much inner turmoil and in, going on that you know anything extra just feels like too much. Okay, um, and then how can we deal with it? <clears throat> the real way is to build up that resilience. And I know people will talk about self-care and, and I should, probably should create another video where I tell you why I have so many issues with this kind of industry, but self-care is not an expensive thing. Self-care doesn't take a lot of time. It can. I would love a vacation in Hawaii that's full, fully paid and I get massage. I mean, that'd be awesome if I could afford that, right? But I can't. So what can I do for basic self-care? I can make sure I'm eating regularly. I can make sure that I'm drinking enough water. <clears throat> I can make sure that I'm making time for my friends to connect with people who are important to me, whatever that could, may look like online, in person, whatever. Make sure I'm taking my medicine as prescribed. <clears throat> <clears throat> Almost choked on my own spit. <clears throat> I can make sure I'm taking my medication as prescribed. I can make sure that I'm you know, getting enough sleep. There's all sorts of things. I go to a therapist. I can see a psychiatrist. Those are all things that are really good for me, me taking care of myself. I can make sure that I exercise at a, you know, frequency that feels good. All of those things give me more ability to weather the storms of life and build that up. And so that's really how we deal with this. And alongside that, because this is due to trauma, seeing a trauma therapist and working through to process what occurred to manage the the body symptoms or however it's experienced for you that's going to be really key also and that will kind of lower our overwhelm or buildup that's already happening that like under the surface the reason that we have you know this just teeny window of ability to deal with life it will expand that window open it up we call this in therapy a lot of times they'll say we want to expand your window of tolerance sometimes i'm like guys we need to explain what we're saying it's essentially this is the amount we have before freak out so small and we want to expand that so we have more wiggle room for life's ups and downs okay now there was a comment on this says it can relate to all of this as an add-on why do i feel so overwhelmed about nearly anything not just traumatic or triggering things how can I not feel so overwhelmed? And I left this question in, even though the answer is essentially the same, because I didn't realize that people were probably making the assumption that getting overwhelmed easily meant that those things had to be triggering or traumatizing or connected to, you know, a triggering traumatizing thing. We get overwhelmed easily because we don't have any wiggle room for basic life stressors. When someone adds something else to our to-do, it can just shoot us through. We're just like, that's too much. And so that's essentially why, again, back to that resilience or that window of tolerance, it's so thin that it doesn't really matter what the thing is. We immediately feel overwhelmed because we're kind of just barely white knuckling or like surviving, you know, it's like barely keeping our head above water. And so when someone adds a little more water to the pool, we're like, oh, we can't, cannot tolerate it. And so that's, that's why it's the same answer the same ways of how to not get overwhelmed is to build up that resilience. Now there was another um, add on to this. So this is so true. And as an add on, why do we feel so overwhelmed if something goes too fast? I'll talk about this too. I have the impression that for trauma patients, nearly everything just goes too fast and too quickly in this world. What if everything is too fast? And how do we explain to others that we need way much more time and are overwhelmed by the littlest things? I think because and this is my hypothesis, because our resilience or our window of tolerance is so thin, so little bit of it, there's not much to go around. We need time to process things and assess whether or not they're a threat. And if we don't get that time, everything feels threatening. And I think it's that hypervigilance. You know, it's almost like the best analogy I can give is that we're like a bomb squad and we think everything in our environment is a bomb because our brain is telling us that everything is threatening, right? When we have trauma, and we react to that potential threat that puts us into like fight, flight, freeze. And so our world can get really small, right? Like if I associate loud noises with the trauma, then concerts are out. Even being around loud cars is out. People slamming doors sends me through the roof, right? And I, so I slowly try to avoid those things and my world gets really small. Then everywhere I look are potential triggers, potential trauma things, right? So bombs. And we're like a bomb squad 
we have to go out. First, we put the robot, we send it out to check. What is it? We don't know. Okay, it doesn't look like it's dangerous. Okay, then we have to go check as the bomb people. And we have to take it apart. It takes time. And we have to do that for each one of those scenarios. But the world doesn't work like that, right? We don't always have a week to process something and decide. It needs our response. What are you going to do? Okay, we're moving forward without you, right? People can just push things through and we can feel overwhelmed or this can happen in groups too. Where do we want to eat? Oh, I don't know. I'd rather eat here. And that place is super triggering and uncomfortable. Oh, my back has to be to the door. I can't handle it. We start to max out, but people are moving forward. We're going to this place and it can just start to feel like too much because we don't have enough time to diffuse and ensure that that's not a bomb or that that's not a threat. And so I think that's why. And I, I think the best way to explain it to people maybe is to use that analogy but that it depends on how much you want to share, right? Because we're going to have to let them know that because of past trauma, we often think things are threatening that technically aren't, but it takes us time to realize that it isn't. And when we're forced to move through things too quickly, we don't get the time to process what we're going to have to do, what changes are going to have to be made. You know, it feels like it's a threat to our safety and we get overwhelmed. And we just need more time to kind of transition between tasks to assess what we're going to have to do to prepare ourselves emotionally. And I know for some people, they're like, seriously, you would have to do that? Yeah, because everything feels scary. It feels overwhelming. We don't have any window of tolerance. We're just barely keeping our head above water. So when people throw things at us at a quick rate, we go under. It's too much. We haven't had time to assess and process and decide and to not get not and to feel like you don't get the chance to decide in and of itself can be like triggering and tra re-traumatizing potentially, especially, you know, if the trauma was someone taking away our choice. So you can see how that can kind of build on one another. So that's why it happens. <clears throat> it can just feel like the world is moving too fast. To explain to others, I would just say something to the effect of and put your own words to it. You know, I, I've been really maxed out because of, you know, past trauma, things that have affected me that I find when we have to make decisions really quickly, I, I need a little bit more time. It, it feels too fast to me. You know, it's just letting them know and always ending with what they can do to help. So what I need from you is if possible, because there's not always going to be situations where they can wait, unfortunately, but in most cases they can, if possible, let me know as soon as you can and try to give me some time and maybe ask me how much time I think I'm going to need because that's fair, right? And we we might not have an answer for that, but we might have an idea. Okay, this feels, uh, can you give me an hour? Go back to an hour, right? <clears throat> or it's on the move. We're going to try to figure it out. Why don't you get to decide this or that? You know, giving you a choice, if that's helpful, let them know what is helpful. Okay. Now there was another add-on. It says, is it normal to feel exhausted more easily if you experienced trauma in the past, even if it was a long time ago, like childhood? I get physically and mentally exhausted much sooner than other people, and it makes it harder for me to keep up with work and university. What can I do about this? Yes, it's it's very normal. Usually the reason is to do with that hypervigilance or that on edge feeling, that fight, flight, freeze, because what that does to our system is it dumps energy to get us, to ready us to take action. Essentially, our nervous system is like, oh my God, we're under threat. Whoa, 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 sound the alarm, sound the alarm. We're under threat. Okay, it shuts down our prefrontal cortex, which is like our good problem solver. Um, it's the, the adult part of our brain helps us put together organized thought, plan things, all of that. We don't need that. Instead, it helps our pupils dilate so we can see better, it helps us breathe better. You ever get scared and all of a sudden your nose is cleared up? Like if you were stuffy, you're like, <clears throat> wow, it just clears that all out so we can breathe and it sends a bunch of energy and adrenaline and cortisol and all these things to help us move to get us out of the threat so when we've been traumatized even if it was when we we're younger we can find ourselves held in that hyper vigilance need to move energy coursing through us for a long time sometimes days weeks months sometimes off and on almost every day we can feel this on edge, looking around, assessing for threat, feeling that that just surge of energy with nothing to do about it. 
And that can leave us exhausted. All of that energy is still going out, even though we're not really taking action for it and being on edge and being hyper vigilant, looking around in our environment, it takes a lot of energy. So it's exhausting. That's why you're feeling that way. And the best way to manage this is to get into therapy as soon as possible. And one way to get that energy kind of out and kind of disperse it so it doesn't continue to course and cause us to feel more anxious or more overwhelmed or more dysregulated, full body shakes, stomping our feet. You might excuse yourself if you're at school or at work to go into the bathroom and just do that when no one's in there. Ooh, you know, shake it out. <clears throat> get it out of your system. Um, that can help kind of calm us down. Breathing exercises work for some people, not all. Um, but those are all things that you can do in the moment while working in therapy to manage that and to kind of bring that down. And therapy is going to involve probably a lot of like process-based coping skills where we need to journal or talk it out. And then also, you know, some more like distraction-based coping skills. So when you start to feel overwhelmed, can we pull our brain over to this? You know, talk with your therapist and come up with some coping skills that work for you, but that will help get you through when you start to just you feel exhausted and you feel yourself getting into that hypervigilance or on edge kind of space. Okay. Another add on, there were a lot. There's two more. It says, as an add on, I can relate to the feeling of being overwhelmed easily, but can you also define trauma? Good question. I sometimes think that most people were somehow traumatized in childhood. Most people were. Um, I have a video from a long time ago. If you want to search, just search uh, what is traumatized. Katie Morton, it should come up. <clears throat> and I talk about what this is. But trauma occurs when we fear for the safety or life, safety, emotional, psychological, physical, right? Any kind of safety of ourselves or someone else. I know that's very broad, but this can be us watching a sibling or a parent get harmed. That's traumatizing. Um, this could be watching someone through a live stream be harmed, traumatizing, watching on a TV show. Um, if we fear for the safety or life of someone else or ourselves, we can be traumatized. However, a huge piece to remember is that not everybody who's traumatized will develop PTSD. Okay? We can be traumatized, use our resources, process it, um, have some healthy coping skills and a support system, and never develop symptoms of PTSD. And then some of us who don't have as many resources, maybe due to having a really rock rocky upbringing, no one's supportive around us. Maybe we've already been traumatized before and managed it. And so we're kind of, our resilience is a little thin, you know, because we're repeatedly traumatized. That can cause us to lead to symptoms of PTSD. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how the trauma, how I define trauma. Now, um, I think most people were traumatized in childhood because we think of traumas as like these big T events, like uh, abuse, a, an accident, but a lot of little T events happen, moving a lot. Um, having a bad teacher who was kind of rude or maybe being bullied for a semester in school, um, maybe ha having financial struggles, going through a divorce, whether you're the child or the person in the divorce, um, you know, all of that stuff can add up to us feeling traumatized. And we often downplay or poo poo those like smaller T's because we're like, well, everybody goes through that, but that doesn't make it okay. That doesn't mean it's not traumatizing. That doesn't mean it doesn't make us fear for our own safety. Think of like, especially like financial strife. You know, I've been broke before and poor and it was hard and it's, but it's super stressful. And I don't think enough people recognize just how hard and how, how much that wears on you and makes you worry about your ability to sustain your life, right? To what, to pay for a roof over your head and food to put in your belly. It, it's very stressful, you know? Um, so just, you know, don't, don't downplay those things. They're real. Okay. Now the final add on says I had to stop university because I got so exhausted from trying to focus. My body feels so heavy and tired. I really don't know what to do. Does this get better with trauma therapy? Yes. I'm doing CBT at the moment and it does help, but not with my concentration and exhaustion. Now CBT is definitely focused on your thoughts and behaviors and something that might benefit you since you're feeling it so deeply in your body is some somatic based work, whether we have a somatic experiencing therapist or somatic based therapist that could really help. Um, it might also help for you just to do something that's a little less, I don't know, structured. CBT can be great, but it also doesn't work for all of us. And maybe you're just needing something else because 
the exhaust and trying to focus, I'm like, oh, is that depression or is it PTSD? I don't know her whole history. Um, but it, it, since you mentioned trauma therapy, I'd assume there's some trauma there. I think we should get into trauma. There is trauma focused TF CBT, trauma focused cognitive behavioral therapy that could be beneficial. Um, you could ask your therapist if they know of someone who does that, but that could be a way to take it past just our, you know, thoughts, feelings, and actions or behaviors and dig into more of this like trauma based, like body memories or whatever's coming up for you so that we can move through those symptoms so they don't affect you anymore. Okay. Let's move on to question number four. This question says, hi, Katie, I hope you're well. I am. I hope you're well. It says, I'm just wondering how you push through the weirdness, uncomfortableness, and vulnerability of doing inner child work. My therapist has asked me to close my eyes and to picture myself at a specific moment and tell myself what I needed to hear. The problem is every time I go to close my eyes, I feel strange and I end up opening my eyes and looking around the room. I tried multiple times, but I felt the resistance within my body. I just couldn't engage with it. Is this normal? Have you had this with your clients in the past? And if so, how do I move through this? Or should I just skip it all together and not do this work? Thanks, Katie. Okay. Great question. Inner child work isn't for everybody. But in this case, I think maybe the visualizations, the closing your eyes, like the the way that they're going about it is not helpful. And something that might be helpful, let's just try this before we try, you know, toss it out. Journaling to and from a younger you. What would you say to younger you? Can you write that out? Like in a letter, you know, dear younger Katie, I wish you knew um, that things will turn out. You know, I know you have a lot of self-doubt. Like, remember there used there was that old video we did. How was it? It was called Dear Me. It was an old uh, challenge way back in the day, probably like eight years ago on YouTube. What a great thing to do. What a great trend. Um, why don't you do a Dear Me? Let's pretend. And it doesn't, it just has to be to you before. What do you wish you knew? Let's start there. And that can feel a little weird, right? And it's Yes, we should push past the weirdness, but if it's not allowing us, if we can't, then we have to try a different route, right? Sometimes one certain tool or technique for inner child work isn't going to resonate with us. It's not going to work. So we have to try another way. So let's start with letter writing. If that's hard or if you're like, but it feels like it's just me talking to myself, you can try writing. So I'm left-handed, writing with your dominant hand as adult you. So I'd write with my left hand, dear younger Katie, blah, blah, blah. But younger Katie writes with the right hand. So it looks like a child's writing. That can be helpful. Having a photo of yourself at that age can be helpful. But let's start with that more journal-based stuff versus trying to visualize it in session and say it out loud. I feel like that is like a whole nother level of vulnerability and kind of cringiness. And that might be what's getting in the way. So let's try that before we say, you know, it's not going to work for me. Um, I think that might just not be a good way to get into it for you. There was a comment on this as, as an add-on, is the inner child the same as a younger self? I feel like my inner child is my younger self and I hate her so much. I grew up in a household where my female primary caregiver, I cannot even call her mother, emotionally and physically abused me. I feel like I blame my younger self for allowing the abuse to go on. If she had just killed herself, she could have spared adult me a lot of pain. But at the same time, I realize I'm blaming myself, younger me. I feel like she's completely a separate ad- entity to me. It's like we're two different people. I don't feel connected to her. I have zero compassion for her. And I hate her so much for all the pain I'm left to deal with. I'm sorry if this doesn't make sense. I'm just so angry, confused, and my soul is in so much pain. That's okay. It totally makes sense. Younger self is inner child you. Um, I guess the only, it's really no difference. It just inner child is just a term that we use a lot, but younger self is us at another time, you know, um, it's the same. And I want to normalize being angry at our inner child. I talked about this, you know, if anybody's wanting to do inner child work, I have a workshop available on my website. I'd encourage you to check it out. Yes, I know you have to pay for it, but I put a lot of effort into those and they're, it's like four hours of live streaming and questions being answered. And that will hopefully help also downloadable worksheets and homework and all sorts of stuff. Um, Go over to katiemorton.com and you can check that out. So we being mad at our younger self and being like, why'd you let this happen? It is normal and part of the process. It's okay to allow that conversation to be had. It's okay to yell and blame them 
but then they get to talk back. We're in a fight with them. Younger you gets to speak up and be like, do you realize how little resources I had? How the fuck did you expect me to get out of there? How was I supposed to stop the abuse? What would I have done? Do you remember what it was like to be me? Because usually when we're angry, it's because we're hurt. And we're looking back at what happened and we're like, how did I let this go on for so long? We're shaming, we're blaming ourselves. We're taking ownership over something we had no control over. And we're looking back with adult eyes and we forget what it was like to be that little us. What we had available, what was around us. What could we really do? What do we even know existed? Like a younger me, first of all, we had no cell phones, no internet. That cuts resources a lot. I didn't have a job, obviously, until I was like 16. Well, I mean, I guess I babysat at like 15, but still had no money of my own. That's a huge resource. Couldn't drive a car, right? And think of these things. Um, I was much smaller, wasn't as strong, couldn't really fight people off. You know, think about those things, but it's okay to be angry and to fight back and forth with younger us. That's a normal part of the process. Okay, let's move on to question number five. And this question says, hi, Katie, what's the best way to instill self-confidence in tweens so that they don't feel like they have to measure up to what they see on social media and are able to be confident within themselves? We all know that comparison is the thief of joy. We do. Thanks for all that you do. Of course. What a great question. And I think the best, there's a couple of things I'm going to talk about here. When it comes to teens or tweens, that's a tough time. That's like puberty time. It's super uncomfortable. It's like middle school in the States. That's what we call it. It's kind of the middle school age. And I think there's two parts. First, as a parent or a teacher or an aunt or a cousin, if you're older and you have a tween in your life, being honest with them about social media, I think is really important. Reminding them that nobody wants to take pictures of their kids when they're fighting them. No one wants to film their husband when they're in the the midst of a huge argument. Nobody takes pictures of the worst days of their life, right? That's just not how it is. We only share the highlights. And I think letting children know that and also filters. I mean, there was that, what was it called? Bold glam or something on TikTok. That was crazy. It like made my teeth super white and like made my chin really pointy. It was very weird. But you couldn't really tell it was a filter, which is creepy. And so just talk, having honest conversations with children about social media and the fact that it's not real and then limiting the amount of time they spend on it. I know kids can fight and tweens are particularly difficult, but, you know, have dinner at the table where you talk to each other. I'm talking like parents mainly now, but have dinner at the table where you talk to each other, no phones allowed, you know, um, take their phones or iPads or whatever at night. Don't let them bring it into their room. I know kids are going to get mad, whatever. I was mad about all sorts of shit too. I wanted a phone in my room. My mom said no. Remember, we didn't have cell phones back then. Um, Do things to limit that so that, you know, they're not always digesting that kind of content. And then the biggest piece I really think, so that's important and it's a vital part, but the second and what I'd argue is maybe a more important piece is getting your child or tween into something that they can be good at. I don't care what this is. I don't care if this is a knitting club, if they are part of band or part of choir or part of any sport, basketball, baseball, soccer, whatever, whatever you have, lacrosse, I don't care, anything, um, or get them into like science club, whatever they like doing, let's find a group that likes to do it too. They want to go bowling, send them, sign them up for a bowling league. Whatever it is, let's get them into something. In therapy, we call that like building mastery. It's a part of DBT. And the reason it's in that is like because we feel good about ourselves when we're good at something. I know that's like kind of obvious, but we don't think about a lot of times when we think about like building confidence. We don't think about, hey, maybe I should work at something and be good at it. Maybe that means if you can afford it, you get your child into, you know, guitar lessons or cooking classes or sewing class, anything that they want to do. Let's support it. You know, like one of my neighbors, her son isn't particularly athletic. He doesn't really enjoy much of anything like that. And she's tried everything. And then he found, there's two things. He found volleyball, which the boys, they don't even have a boys volleyball team, right? Crazy in his school. So she found him like a select one out of school. He couldn't be happier. Also, he learned that he really likes building sets for plays. And so he's the stage manager awesome. How great. 
We need to find things that our children are interested in, especially the tweens, giving them something to feel good about themselves. Then that Honestly, all that time that they're doing that stuff, yeah, they might take pictures to post on social media, but that's like time in person doing something that they enjoy. And we need to spend more time and more, put more effort into making that happen. Okay. Let's move on to question number six. It says, real quick one, Katie, I'm a manager at my job and one of my employees is dealing with a newly worsening panic attacks. She's on medication that doesn't really work for her and on the wait list for therapy. Oh, I'm so sorry to that person. So far, we've learned she needs distraction-based coping skills and has a tendency to try to push herself to stay at work longer because unfortunately, money is a thing. It is for all of us, isn't it? So annoying. How can I help her come down from these attacks so she doesn't have to go home and miss work? P.S. The main issue is an irrational fear of dying suddenly. A couple of her friends, unfortunately, have met an early end to their stories. Oh, that's so sad. Okay. We have to ask her. First of all, you're such a great manager. I'm so thankful that you people like you are out there to that actually care about their staff and want to be able to help them. So thanks for asking this. And I'm glad that you're there. So you've learned she needs distraction based coping skills. So I would, if it's appropriate, ask her how you can help say, okay, so you like to distract. If you're feeling overwhelmed, she's going to have to give you some signals. We're going to have to have some kind of signal system, especially because she's going to push herself to stay at work. So we need to have some kind of protocol. What can she, um, if she's not able to speak and let us know, can she move something to a particular area or bang on a desk like two hits or something? I don't know. Maybe there's a way she can indicate it. But find out what kind of distractions are the most helpful and then do those. Call attention to something. Oh my God, did you see that film about such and such? Or oh my God, look over there. Okay, that's blue. How many things are blue in this room? We can inst- like start or instigate a conversation about a grounding technique, right? How many things are blue in this room? Funny. How, you know, and and cue her, let's say her name's Katie. Katie, tell me how many blue things do you see? I know those things sound silly and it's kind of weird in the moment, but it is helpful to pull us out if we're starting to spiral. But I think it is really key to, if you think this is okay, asking her what has helped and how you can best help. Let her guide the way because everybody's so different. I've had people who like physical touch, like a hand on the back. Other people hate it. It can make it worse. Um, Some people like to be asked questions. Other people like you to talk about specific things and draw their attention to, you know, so we just kind of want to ask her what's the most helpful and then, you know, make sure that we can do those things. Make sure they're available at all different. I don't know what kind of job you have, but at different parts of the job. So let's say we work at a Starbucks. We want to make sure that if it's slam and busy, we can still do this thing quickly. And then if it's not, we have some that are longer that we can do. So make sure there's like a variety of things with her. Um, But yeah, and then coming down from the attack, she might just need a little break. I think changing the temperature is really helpful. If you have any way to like put a washcloth under cold water and offer it to her to put on her neck or her face, that can be really helpful too. That's been probably one of the most beneficial techniques for my patients. Um, I know that's not a distraction though. And she said distraction. So I'm just giving you some ideas, but ask her what helps most. Let's find ways to make it happen. Um, yeah. And then hopefully she can get into therapy and get her medication changed soon because, oh, this is so dysregulating. Also something that the full body shakes I was talking about before and like stomping your feet, you could let her know, Hey, I talked to this weird therapist online. And she said, sometimes when you're feeling the bit, like the buildup, because what my goal for her, and obviously this is not your role. My goal for her would be to figure it out earlier before we're already going to go into a panic. Um, and like kind of stomp her feet and keep herself grounded. But even coming out of it, that can release some of that ex- that excess panic energy that we can feel for like hours after a panic attack. She can kind of shake it out. Okay. I hope that helps and gives you some ideas. Let's move on to question seven. This question says, Katie, I have BED, which is binge eating disorder, if you aren't aware, diabetes, and I live in a bigger body. The meds that I'm on cause weight loss and a feeling of not being hungry. My endocrinologist told me that if I'm not hungry not to eat or intermittent fasting, as he called it. Hmm. The problem is that it makes it easier to slip into other eating disorder habits. Of course, because he didn't ask you about your relationship with food. I will get into this. What are your thoughts on intermittent fasting? Is it safe? And what should I do? Okay. My biggest frustration is when doctors want to treat one symptom and don't consider the psychological components of it. Because like you said, you just switch into other eating disorder habits. You're like, well, then I'm not eating. 
And then instead of having binge eating disorder, we slip into some more anorexic type tendencies or maybe even bulimia tendencies. Hate it. And it's so frustrating because sure, we can be on this medication and it can cause weight loss and we can be like, oh, that's healthy for me. But it doesn't treat the eating disorder thoughts or any of the mental illness component to it, whether the eating disorder comes out of trauma or what, what, what is it helping us cope with, right? It's there for a reason. Therefore, I do not um, subscribe to intermittent fasting. I, it's tricky with this question though, because the medication is, is messing with your hunger fullness. Because I'm a huge, you guys know, I'm a huge supporter of intuitive eating, which takes time and it takes working with someone like a therapist, a dietitian, or both to understand when our body's hungry and when it's full and when we're eating to comfort or when we're not eating to comfort or soothe, right? It takes work. So I don't like any kind of, because I feel like there's always a new fucking diet. We go from, I don't even know, let's say like Atkins or the cabbage soup diet. And then, oh, now we're only, um, I don't even know you guys, there's been so many. Then we're going to go, you know, low carb, a keto. Then we're going to call it something different, South Beach diet. Now we're doing Mediterranean diet. Now we're doing intermittent fasting. And there's always going to be another one as diet people and books and shit like line their pockets with money while we feel worse about ourselves. Okay, rant over for the most part. However, I be- don't believe in any anything where we shouldn't listen to our hunger and eat when we feel that hunger. And intermittent fasting does that. Some of my friends are like, I wait, you know, because I only eat within like this six hour window. I'm like, six hour window? How do you eat every three to four hours? You don't. And I know people can argue and people can say, but it's been proven through research. I still will not subscribe to not listening to our bodies when they're hungry and giving them the fuel that they need. Is it wrong to alter that fuel? No, we should eat a variety of foods. There's no good food, bad foods. I don't put any value on the foods that I eat and you shouldn't either, but our body does need a variety. We can't eat, you know, salads all day. We're going to need some protein of some sort. We can't eat pizza all day. We're going to need some vegetables. You know, there's going to be an ebb and flow of what we want and what our body needs. And we should be able to listen to that. And I feel like intermittent, it's not that it's unsafe. I have not heard anybody, you know, get ill from intermittent fasting, but I am worried about that eating disorder stuff and that we could slip into more restrictive habits. And so I would, hopefully you're in therapy. I would talk to your therapist about this and let's come up with a better, we might, because this is affecting, this is what my patients usually do. When we struggle with an eating disorder and our medication affects hunger fullness, we might just have to go on a meal plan for a while so that we can get in the rhythm and we're not, cause we're not really able to check in with hunger fullness cause it's all messed up. Right. Um, and since you're not super hungry, that might curb some of the binges, but because it's psychological, it might not. I've had patients who won't even feel hungry and they binge because it's more about the soothing, the actual practice of doing the binging. So again, all in all, let's talk to our therapist. Let's come up with a plan that's healthy for us. And just, you know, I don't think your endocrinologist is wrong. Obviously I'm not a doctor, but I don't think that they understand eating disorders. Okay. Final question. Question number eight says, Katie, what are affirmations in the context of therapy? I keep coming across this word and it seems like just saying things to yourself in the mirror, or is there more to it? Oh, there's a lot to unpack here. Okay. Great question. First of all, um, they kind of are just like saying things to yourself in the mirror, writing them down, saying them out loud, you know, any kind of version of like affirming who we are. I'm a good person, you know, just repeated things we say to help us feel better about ourselves. That's the goal of an affirmation. But more and more research comes out and shows that affirmations aren't really helpful. I know. Wild. Because we don't believe them. Right? I talk so much about bridge statements. Affirmations jump right to like the amazing good things. And there's no bridge in between. Of course, I'm not going to believe it. Affirmation out. And then I can feel even worse. So here's what they're talking about now in research. That the compounded shame we can feel from all of a sudden being like, well, shit, I don't even think that about myself. What's wrong with me? Am I so fucked up? I can't even, we just spiral out. Therefore, affirmations themselves are not actually very helpful, but more realistic. Like I was watching this girl on TikTok. I love her. Her name is Samantha. I forget her handle, but um, she's showing herself at the gym because she's like, 
you know, I need to get, take better care of myself. Her back is killing her. And she's like, I know I need to lose some weight. I don't follow it for that content, obviously. I follow it because she's so funny and she has such a great personality and her editing is hilarious. And it's like her amping herself up and she has really bad anxiety. So to get to the gym is like a big hole. Anyway, at the end of them now, she's like, I've decided afterwards, I'm going to say like three, I think it's three or five nice things about myself. And she has a really hard time. And I'm like, that's because it's hard to believe and it's hard to say but she's kind of when she's doing this process, because you're watching her and I love that she's sharing this. She'll say, you know, um, I'm pretty dedicated. I mean, it depends on the situation. And she's like, I guess that's not an affirmation. And I was like screaming at my phone. I'm like, no, that is an affirmation because it's true. You believe it. And it's, it's, it's more positive than you saying, I can't do shit, right? I'm dedicated depending on the situation. That's better than the negative, And it's more believable than a fake affirmation. And so I encourage all of you out there, if you're reading things like positive quotes, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you find yourself almost feeling like bad about the fact that you like poo poo it and like shut it down, then maybe we go for more of the realistic ones, things that like, you know, I know that I can be smart in situations um, that are, you know, about like relationships and psychology, but I'm not very good at, you know, like certain kinds of science and some math stuff. And also I don't really like politics or history right? That's more honest about who I am versus saying like, I know that I'm smart. I'm the smartest person. I don't believe that. That's bullshit. We want things to be more believable. I'm dedicated, right? Within the right given situation. So much better. So we should probably stop using affirmations and start using bridge statements, but it doesn't, you know, it's not as catchy, I guess, or it doesn't sell as many, uh, I don't know, coffee mugs and calendars and things like that, that people buy. So anyways, I hope that's helpful. Thank you all so much for sending in your questions. Thank you for listening and watching. Please share this podcast. It really, really does help. And like I said, head over to my Patreon page if you're looking for more connectivity, more support, and more questions being answered. Have a wonderful rest of your week, and I will see you next time. Bye. Bye.